Uh oh. Okay, we're on air. Hey everybody, welcome to Talk Recovery. to Talk Recovery Radio 100.5 FM. You're listening to us live from the downtown east side and uh, we're at Columbia and Hastings every Thursday live on the radio. Oh, there's our second guest. He's at the front door unlocked. Oh, High tech security. Hi, Scott. Okay, so uh, we come to you live every Thursday. If you like what you uh, hear, you can go to our Facebook page, facebook.com slash talk recovery radio we're also broadcasting live on facebook we usually start the show off with our uh hot topics and there's two conversations going on that's uh, making the press talk recovery radio is powered by uh, last door recovery center and uh, that's new west recovery and global bc is actually at last door right now because the world health organization has just uh, classified video game addiction as an actual disorder. And what they want to do is want to make treatment more available, recognize the disorder as an actual disease and how it's causing harm in a lot of people's lives. So we are uh, talking about that today. It's all over the news. So you can go to uh, Last Door's Facebook page later on today as well and catch that Global BC article. And um, yeah, that's great news because there are lots of people that uh, don't leave the house and play video games all day. It's definitely uh, something that gets in between relationships. So that's something we want to keep an eye on and uh, we'll be doing an interview on the radio about video game addiction very soon. I think we've had a show about that, Francis, eh? Yeah, we yeah. have. So we'll, we'll look at our archives because we've been on air for four years now. Woohoo! Yeah, four years of shows, thousands and of listeners. Our, and we have our very first guest with us today. Oh yeah, Remember? that's right. We're going to be interviewing author Candace Platter. Uh, she's going to talk to us about how to get through New Year's Eve clean and sober. And she was our very first she guest was. years ago. Welcome back, Francis. And later on, we've got what? Scotty D, who's <laughs> going to be doing our personal story of his uh, story of success in recovery. Another uh, big article that's in the news right now is uh, BC is set to provide free clean opioids to drug users in 2018. So I think last week the article was like, hey, they're thinking about it. And then this week they're like, oh, we're just going to do it. So obviously decisions are made way before they hit the press because healthcare just doesn't work that fast. In one week they decide something. So there was one comment, though, on one of the feeds. I think it was the Vancouver Suns article. Um, and somebody said, well, we're in an overdose crisis. We're not in a diabetes crisis. And I just, I mean, I didn't comment because I don't feel like getting into a war on Facebook, but we are in a diabetes crisis right now. Actually, more people die from diabetes each year around the world than drugs, alcohol, nicotine, and all of them combined. And uh, we eat really unhealthy. And yes, people have to pay for their um, diabetes medications and so forth. So we're comparing apples to oranges and all that kind of stuff. I, I think, my opinion, and this is Giuseppe's opinion. I think we just all need to stop arguing about it. And we just need to help people. But my problem uh, with Dr. Tyndall from the CDC, who's kind of behind this free clean opioids, and this is a call out to him. It's like, uh, you know, I have no problems with giving addicts three clean heroin pills a day. My problem is Dr. Tyndall's on record saying heroin addicts can't recover. Recovery doesn't work. And so when you have someone like that with an opinion making these kind of decisions, he should not have any power whatsoever. If why can't our healthcare leaders say recovery works, harm reduction works, here's the continuum of care you choose. But when you got people like Tyndall coming down saying, hey, you know, just do heroin for free because you can't recover, that to me is a crime. And not only should he lose his job, like, I mean, it's just horrible what that man says. Uh, addicts can recover, addicts do recover. And some addicts don't, and they're the ones that uh, need harm reduction and need support and love and compassion. But there's millions of people that are clean and sober, and I'm just appalled at Dr. Tyndall and what he's doing. So that's my take. I'm going to take over the camera because Francis is going to do our first interview. Hi, Francis. Hi, Giuseppe. Should, we, should we open the door for Scotty there? Yeah, let's get okay, Scotty. Let's Scotty get Scotty. Scotty. Let's get Scotty. This is live radio, studio. everybody. <laughs> 
Jen. Come on in, Scott. And our second guest. Hey, Scott. Hey, hi. You just have a seat right there. This is Budget uh, Co-op Radio. Awesome. Love it. Love, <laughs> love it, right? Yeah. We've got a security door for the front door, but we don't have a security code for that door. Okay. Are we ready to go? We're ready to go. Awesome. So today we get to talk to uh, Candace Platter, author of Loving an Addict, Loving Yourself. Very well-known book in recovery circles, very well-known lady in recovery circles. And so we're going to talk to her about that. And you were our very first guest. I was your very first guest. That's, That's amazing. amazing. Four years. That's just amazing. Four years. And yeah, yeah. unfortunately, the, the overdose crisis has really increased since then. So mm -hmm. we'll talk a little bit about that later. But first of all, let's talk about uh, loving an addict, loving yourself. Why is that so hard? Why is it so hard to love an addict and love yourself? Well, I think that the people who love addicts are um, remembering them the way they knew them before. And people really love those people, you know. Um, and I think it's also really difficult for them because they don't know what to do to help. They desperately want to help. They love these people. They want to help. What do they do? Often they're doing the wrong things because there's very little help out there for people who are loved ones of addicts. So what are some of the wrong things that you can do? What, are, what is a way that you don't? Um, well, you know, one of the most common ones is to give money to an addict. Don't ever give money to an addict because you know where it's going to go, right? Sometimes people let them live at home. These are addicts in active addiction I'm talking about. So letting them live in your home, use in your home, drink in your home, become abusive and obnoxious and punch holes in walls and call you every name in the book and they're still allowed to live there. But that's an enabling stance. So what is the difference between enabling and helping? How, yeah. do you, how do you help your loved ones? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, the way that I define it is that enabling keeps the addiction going and a helping behavior is going to assist it to stop. Okay, so, so for those parents that, you know, say they have a, you know, a daughter, she's 22 and they don't want to kick her out on the streets, but, uh, but she's using at home and living there rent free and using all her money towards drugs and partying and that sort of thing. Um, so do they say, like, what do they do in order to like, they don't want to kick their daughter out because they don't want her to be homeless or couch surfing or that sort of thing. That. But what, um, what can they do in that situation? I get a lot of people, a lot of clients who come to me, a lot of loved ones who come to me saying exactly that. I can't kick them out. I can't kick her out. And I say to them that I really understand how they feel. It's a very scary proposition. But if they're going to tell me that they're never going to do that, if that's a boundary for them, very, very strong boundary, there's not going to be a whole lot I can do. Because what we need, I'm not saying that everybody needs to kick their addicts out. There are many things we can do before that happens. Many other strategies to use before that happens, but it may be something that needs to happen. So we need to make it a lot less cushy for an addict we need to have really clear, healthy, self-respectful boundaries. The loved ones need to start to identify what their boundaries really are. Then they need to learn how to language those boundaries so that the addicts will actually hear it. And they need to learn how to maintain those boundaries, especially in the harder times, because that's problematic. But if you set a boundary, if a loved one sets a boundary, and then they cave because, you know, an addict's job, an addict in active addiction, their job is to wear you down, right? So if you allow that to happen, you might as well never ever set a boundary again because they're just gonna keep poking at you, you know, right here where it hurts until you cave. I can't help but think that this sounds a lot like small children. Well, yes, and um, I don't know about you, but I remember when I was in active addiction and I was just like a small child, and you had to repeat things to me many, many times for me to finally understand it, and even then I probably didn't. Yeah, so how, what are some strategies that family members can do to, in order to hold their ground? Because 
it is like a large child having a super huge tantrum, mm -hmm. which is actually frightening mm -hmm. if that person has any strength. Yep. So, you know. And if the person doesn't have strength, they'll do something like steal jewelry or they'll do something passive aggressive if they're not actually aggressive. Right. So, yeah. so there's safety issues. And, there are safety issues. And even just fear. Mm -hmm. Like, so, yeah. so what are some ways and strategies of, of people being able to, like, just lock themselves in their room and, like, get a good lock? <laughs> well, you know, some people do that. It's really unfortunate. The way some people are living in their own homes because they've allowed addicts to live in their home, um, it, it, it's, it's awful. And, and there is no self-respect from the loved ones. They don't feel any of that when they're allowing themselves to be used in that way. But they're so used to it. It's their comfort zone. So addicts, uh, loved ones of people with addiction need to be willing to come out of their own comfort zones. So and, right. and a comfort zone isn't something that's comfort that, that's healthy. It's just comfortable. It's how you've been living for a long time. And it's usually the loved one that needs to come out of their comfort zone before the addict will. I was saying to Giuseppe the, before that, you know, addicts don't come up to their loved ones and say, please set some boundaries for me. Please set some healthy, clear boundaries for me. That doesn't happen. So the loved ones need to, um, they need to be working maybe with somebody like myself who will help them understand why they haven't set these boundaries. What's going on for them? Why are they not doing this? Because there's usually a reason for that. And once we get to that, and they start to understand that enabling is never, ever, ever a loving act toward an addict, because it just keeps it going. Keeps it going, it right. It keeps it going. So when they really start to get that, when that light bulb goes on, they change what they're doing. It's really quite amazing. So what I'm hearing you say is that they sort of lead by example, like they don't wait for the addict to change, that they they maybe change the way that they interact with mm -hmm. with the person that's struggling with addiction, or um, or that they change the the way, yeah, just the way that they the way that they might interact with that person, like just saying like almost treating them as though maybe they they are like a child. Like yeah. I think like when I think of my daughter, she's very dramatic. I don't know where she gets it from, but anyways, and um, <laughs> she can be very dramatic and I really have to stand my ground with her. And I do think like, you know, if I let this get out of hand, she's going to get bigger and, you know, stronger and it could be frightening. So, mm -hmm. yeah. so yeah. And, and then there's, then, there, then there's that, right? Because you think, well, in these families, like maybe in our families, like I didn't learn boundaries in my family. I, I learned it in my 12 step fellowship and in my own recovery. Yeah. So like how, what role does that play in terms of like even people learning those things in recovery and being able to pass those things on to their children? Cause to, to learn, to act in a new way without any support of that new way, I would imagine would be nearly impossible. Mm -hmm. And it's, and it's very interesting that most loved ones have grown up in families with addiction of some sort. And many of them have learned throughout their lifetimes that being a people pleaser is more rewarded than acting out. So they learn how to please everybody and put their own needs on the back burner. And then they come into marriages or they have children who become addicted or already were addicted if they're, you know, like a relationship. Um, and they're busy trying to please everyone still. They don't know what else to do. And when it isn't working, it's kind of like that good old Dr. Phil question. You know, I'm not a huge fan of Dr. Phil at all, but every once in a while he says something that's useful. And that question of how's that been working for you? How's that been working for you, he says. And most people say, not very well. And if the answer is not very well, then the next question has to be, are you willing to try something different? Right. And uh, Giuseppe was alluding to um, the, new, uh, the new government initiatives uh, about giving clean, safe drugs out on the streets. And so there's, you know, there's some... Mm. There's some chatter about uh, about whether the government is spending too much money on um, people with addiction problems, and uh, there's other people that you know think that these funds could be allocated to better places or more deserving places or that sort of thing. 
do you think that the government is enabling the addict or are they helping the addict? Well, first of all, I'd like to say that, in my opinion, addicts are very worthy people and deserve to have good treatment. At the same time, only the addicts who really want that treatment are going to go get that treatment. So we know that. It's a choice about whether to stay in active addiction or whether to go into active recovery. And anybody who's in active recovery knows that because we've made that choice. Right? So this is such a loaded question. Um, I do think that society enables the addiction. I think uh, we're a very addicted society to begin with, and we're a very enabling society, and a lot of things need to change. I see this all the time. Yeah. But I, you know, is it a good idea to give them clean, safe drugs? Is it not a good idea to give them clean, safe drugs? I really heard what Giuseppe was saying about the guy who's talking about this. I'm glad I'm not in that position to have to make that decision. <laughs> but, you know, what I, what I would like to see is for money to be allocated once again, because I think it was really cut back several years ago, once again to treatment, to prevention, to education, to detoxes, which, you know, y you want to go into a detox now, and you have to wait days and days and days, and you have to be in a position of being able to call and call and call to see if there's a bed, and that's crazy. Yeah, I was talking to a friend of mine that's actually going to the schools and talking in the schools, and I and I contacted my son's uh, my son's principal to get to see if I could get him in the school, and uh, and he's going in the school. But I realized, like until then, I didn't realize like there isn't anyone going to the school and talking to people. And you think of how many people there are in addiction in recovery, like uh, doing doing service, and it's it's surprising that there aren't more more energy towards uh, towards prevention yeah and there used to be a lot of that um, in service work for you know as part of 12-step programs I'm not sure if there still is but they used to do a lot of a lot of service work when they'd go out to schools they'd go out to hospitals and prisons and, and places where people were still grappling with addiction I think uh, I think we still are, but it was just surprising though. I was like, hmm, interesting. There's there's a bit of a, a gap there. Needs for service. So, yeah. so New Year's is coming up, and um, and I know that you have uh, ten survival tips for. Yeah. Is it, it for the, the ten survival tips are for for loved ones who love addicts. Oh, okay. Um, and they're the ones that probably stay either clean and sober or don't drink very much. Right. So, the, so talking about New Year's Eve for them in terms of using drugs and alcohol is not really what we need to do. But I think, you know, if we're going to talk about loved ones, if we are, then we need to give them some strategies around what to do for the addicts who are going to, you know. Okay. But if you wanted to talk about addicts who are in recovery, trying to stay clean through New Year's Eve, is that kind sure. of where you're yeah, going? Yeah, let's go there. Yeah. Um, you know, I just put out a blog post, and I've, I've put out the same one a couple of, a few years in a row because a lot of people really like it, and it's about, instead of setting resolutions, it's about setting intentions, because it's just a different energy, right? The, the resolution is what I should do, right? Quote, unquote, should do. The intention is, what do I really want to do? Um, and so... I think when when we when we think about addicts in recovery who who are trying to stay clean through and sober through uh, New Year's, again, you know that whole choice thing is really important. The concept of choice because you know there's there's three or four of us in this room now who are in recovery, and any one of us could relapse. Any one of us could if we're not taking care of ourselves we could relapse. If we don't make the choice every day that we're not going to relapse, we could relapse. That's how that works. So it's it's also about, am I going to stay clean and sober during New Year's Eve? If I really want to stay clean and sober, I'm going to do that. If I'm not sure and I'm kind of skittering on the edge, then I might use or drink, and everybody would understand because it's New Year's Eve, and you know, I could get, get away with it maybe. But it's a self-respect piece. So the intention 
instead of a resolution, the intention is an inner kind of thing where you, you care about how you feel. You care about how you feel inside and whether you're respecting yourself. And addicts and alcoholics especially, we know that when we use or drink, it feels good for about five minutes, maybe even shorter, before we realize what we've done to ourselves. Yes, and I find that that, um, that honeymoon period gets over the, shorter, yeah, and shorter. It's shorter and shorter. It's shorter and shorter. It's like any bad relationship. It's like any bad relationship. <laughs> the honeymoon period gets shorter and shorter. Yeah, yeah and you're in true. a bad relationship with yourself if you're not respecting yourself. So if you if you so you know, but there are strategies. If you really want to stay clean and sober, then there are strategies that you can use. Like make sure your sponsor is available, or if you're not in a twelve step program, make sure that you have a friend or people, family who will support you in staying clean and sober. Um, there are dances that are clean and sober, there are parties, and if you're an introvert like me, I probably wouldn't go to a clean and sober dance because that's just not who I am, but you know, to stay alone on New Year's Eve might not be the best idea. You know, they say that an addict alone is in bad company, and I think especially on New Year's Eve because it's really, it's really easy to start feeling self-pity it's really easy to start feeling sad and depressed and lonely and all those things that a drug or a drink might help. Yeah, I, de I definitely find that um, I'm a bit of an introvert too, but so, yeah. so I don't know. And I have three kids, so whenever I'm alone, it's like, yay. Like, I know, me too. <laughs> I can think. I can think. Oh, that's amazing. Yay. Yeah, I know. I can like, get the clicker. Like, yeah. It's like, yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's far too odd but so, anyhow but you know if you're an introvert and you can find a way to also be connected to people during that time people that you love and trust and don't keep saying to you oh get out there go party mm -hmm. no um yeah i think i think that's what recovery does is it allows you to accept yourself and oh, and yeah. a big part for me was realizing that all those parties that i was going to is that i needed to drink a lot in order to feel like comfortable Normal. and so when I stopped going to the big parties then I didn't have to like it just sort of erased that whole thing although I do need to get out more but anyways that's another thing so I want to talk to you about your book okay. um, so you're you're making an offer today um, on our talk recovery page and what is that offer the offer is for the loved ones for the family because um, I work exclusively with families now because it just doesn't work for me to work just with the addict. Um, the, if the family doesn't change what they're doing and the addict go, goes into recovery and then goes back, we're into treatment, goes back into that dysfunctional family. So I work with the whole family. Um, so, so my offer is for a free 60 minute uh, telephone consultation where they can tell me what's going on for them in their family and I can let them know how I might be able to help or somebody else might be able to help or I can just give them suggestions and I'd even throw in a free book with that. So hey. yeah. here's, here's the book if you haven't seen it. Yeah, it's been revised a few times, but yeah. Yeah, and it is a great book and it's super helpful and uh, Candace is really well known within the recovery community. And uh, you you have some tried and true survival tips. Yes, and yes. you do, and you do gear your practice more towards um, more towards uh, the um, the families. Yes, yeah. the loved ones and the families. I work with the addict as well, um, but not until they're really ready to work with me. Okay, so, so they I might get, come in after. They come in after. Okay. Generally, I get the families ready to get the addict ready. To be ready for me and yeah. then the transformation happens awesome and yeah. i am uh, just happy to just pointing out that uh, i actually forgot to say how you could win the <laughs> the uh the book or the um the free consultation sure so you can just comment you comment your name <laughs> right comment your name um maybe we should make it more fun just that way I don't know. Let's just do a draw. It's New Year's okay. Eve. So just okay. comment to your do a comment, do a like, anything on the uh, Facebook. Put a, put a GIF. Us. Put a GIF of um anything, a comment, a like, <laughs> one of those hearts of, and uh, of uh yeah. 
I don't know. No, I want to. No. Yeah, and then we'll enter all the names. Yeah, no, the names in the draw. <laughs> they may, they may just want to put their names. Yeah, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah comments but, like but a, a, an email address or something. Or no, something? then we have a program that you will program. take all the names of the likes and everything, and then we'll okay. just do a random draw. Excellent. And so you can win a one-hour consultation with the author of Loving an Addict, Loving Yourself, Candace Platter. And just like or comment on this Facebook live feed and you'll be entered in the draw. And the uh, item gets awarded not to a person that's using, but to a not family Not to the person member. that's using. This yes. is for the loved ones of the person who's using. Do I have time to talk about that? Yes. Yeah. So there's an event that's happening tomorrow in Vancouver. Um, it's called the Depression Confessions, and I'm part of that. Um, I'll be speaking and telling my story. So it's it's for people who are struggling with depression and also probably struggling with addiction because do we know any depressed people who are not using addictive behaviors and do we know people who are using addictive behaviors who are not depressed, right? They go hand in hand for most people. Um, so we, we would really like you to come out. It's at the Roundhouse. Um, community center in Yale Town, and it starts at two o'clock. We have an afternoon seg segment and then a another evening segment, and we'll be sharing our experience, strength, and hope, and we'll be talking about how you know if you're ready to let go of this friend called depression or this best friend called addiction. If you're ready to do that, we have a way for you to become involved with us and. Um, so you can go to, I, I hope I have this right, um, depressionconfessions, with an S, dot org, and you can uh, order tickets at $16. And if you can't afford $16, please come anyway, because we really understand that. If you'd like to be there, we want you to be there. And it's also being streamed all over the world. So. For all the introverts, the depressed people who don't want to get out of their pajamas, we really understand that too. But if you can come, um, please do. And if you're living some, someplace else other than Vancouver, then uh, you can sign up to have the streaming. So thank you for allowing me to mention that. That's great. So Giuseppe, anything else? Are we good? Awesome. Uh, thank you for being on the show again. Again, Candace Platter from Loving an Addict, Loving Yourself. Um, yeah, always a pleasure. How can, uh, you had said before, but I don't know, you said how can people get a free copy of your book? Uh, they can email me at Candace at CandacePlatter.com. Now, you have the correct spelling of my name on your page, I hope, because everybody always spells my name wrong. So it's C-A-N-D-A-C-E. And it's P L A T T O R. So it's Candace at CandacePlatter.com. And uh, yeah, if you'd like a book or want to talk to me about maybe having a, a 60 minute consultation, let me know. Thank you so much for being on Talk Recovery Vancouver. Uh, we're going to a song now. Awesome. We're going to listen to Bob Cajun from Tragically Hip. 